Yeah. So if somebody has got some difficulty with attention, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty common, uh, phenomenon to have some executive function difficulties. You know, I'm working with a hockey player right now, um, who was out of play because of an injury. And it was a, it was a combination probably of like that, that ADHD that athletes have, you know, they're exceptional on the court or the, or the high pressure, but they're not as good under the low as well as some concussion stuff. And so we were doing a lot of, uh, uh, work around those features and, um, his name is Connor Carrick. I, I can speak of course, cause he's public about his neurofeedback, but you can check out some of the pre-post data we shared, uh, recently, um, looking at how he was improving his brain over time. Uh, the, uh, general thing with executive function with ADHD or impulsivity or distractibility, you tend to get about a standard deviation of change every other month of neurofeedback, every 25 sessions, roughly you get about a standard deviation across things like ADHD. Although again, not diagnostic, the reason you might be impulsive or inattentive could be fatigue or stress or post COVID brain fog or, you know, trauma causing sleep issues or a thousand other things. But when you measure executive function and then you see classic executive function phenotypes in the brain, you go, oh, okay. And then you know, generally, you can move that person up a couple of standard deviations in the bell curve, three months, 40, 50 sessions of training. So this is like three times a week, about uh, maybe four times a week for half an hour is the is the training. And um so I've, you know, I have worked with so many people, thousands and thousands, and almost all of them have really strong uh, transformation. Um, one thing I want to say is you can do work on both things that are built in kind of, and not necessarily a disease process, but can get in the way like ADHD or like, you know, having other quirky features, but you can also rebuild stuff after damage. You know, I, uh, one classic story that I love to tell is about a drinker, alcoholic that I worked with who came in to the, to the office, um, you know, six foot five, 300 pound, bright orange man and liver failure, uh, shaky, nervous, couldn't relax, couldn't stop talking, couldn't, couldn't stop moving. And he was 45 days medically chaperoned been brought to my office from a hospital, completely sober, but just so over aroused, so over activated from 25 years of having a bottle and a half of wine every afternoon. And then more wine out of van and Ambien to fall asleep for maybe two hours in the evening. And then he'd be back on it the next day. And he was just wrecked after years of that. And you look at his brain and his brain was hyper coherent in beta, highly over connected beta waves. And all of his beta was pushed up to 11. Uh, uh, and then his delta waves, his resting waves were non-existent. So he was just the shaky, nervous, you know, in spite of being a giant hulk of a man, you could see through him. He was so nervous. He was just, you know, vibrating so much and very classic, uh, post-alcoholic brain pattern, this hyper arousal in the brain of extra beta, extra coherent beta. And you see it, uh, even 10 years after somebody sobers up, if they've been a daily drinker for a decade or, you know, maybe even several years. Uh, so I came into my office about six weeks, maybe seven weeks after we started working with him and he's on the couch in the waiting area and he's asleep. I said, oh, okay. Is he here for another visit this week? I thought he'd already been a few times. Oh yeah, this is, he, he's not here for uh, for neurofeedback. He discovered he could fall asleep at will. So he called this morning and asked when you came in and he came in half an hour earlier and took a nap to prove to you that he can fall asleep now. Wow. So this is a guy who hadn't fallen asleep at will. Even in the hospital, he had to have Thorazine or Haldol or other you know neuroleptics just to knock him out because he was so overactivated in the absence of alcohol after being chronically drunk for so many years. Yeah. So- you can rebuild really big damage. Or, you know, I had a little girl who was a 10 year old who had a protein folding disorder that essentially left her with developmental issues that were quite significant. Um, and she had drop seizures, you know, sudden seizures uh, a couple times a minute, just, just massive seizures. And then she was back. And we trained her brain for about uh, maybe the first, it took us about two or three weeks to start getting some movement, which is not uncommon. And then we started getting a sense of how her seizures were working and got our thumb on the scale and her seizures dropped over two weeks. They went from happening more than once a minute to happening less than once an hour. Wow. And this is a 10 year old girl whose parent had not slept for 10 years deeply. At least her mom had, but you know, and, and just when somebody's having seizures that often and there's breathing issues and the, and the, and the kid is not necessarily fully verbal, it's very, very scary for the parents. And 
parents were wrecked after a decade of that, of, of caring for somebody who was um, themselves not sleeping well because of the seizures. So getting an hour or two of seizure-free time uh, didn't just help this 10-year-old who actually started developing more after that, you know, had a little more language, a little more eye contact, which tends to happen. You can get some movement in really severe developmental difficulties, which is how I discovered this stuff was working in autism and then going, wait a minute, what? People are changing. We're seeing sensory issues and seizures drop. Wait, what? I didn't think this was possible. And that's why I had to get back into it, but in, in an academic level. But the idea is that you can take a crazy drinker who's been sober and help them rebuild that damage. You can take somebody who's got what would be considered an incurable difficulty, like major genetic issues or major profound autism. And you can actually shape the tissue and you can shape performance and resources. Or you can take a CEO. I I, I get, this is not an isolated case. I get a lot of um, thank you notes, calls, voicemails, and surprise letters from the partners of CEOs. Because CEOs come to me because they want to perform better, usually. And most of the time, you look at their brain, and they're high performers who aren't sleeping and kind of anxious, kind of driven, kind of brittle, kind of obsessive. It's kind of a you know type A. And they work on that successfully and sleep and relax and get some, you know, some stuff uh, moved. And then they ask for other, you know, oh, let's, what else can we do? And I start building in flow state and creativity work for them. And about a week or two later, I get the, the thank you note or the letter or the voicemail from the wife or the partner saying, hey, whatever you're doing, yeah, do, do more. Um, we had the best therapy session. He brought me flowers. Um, he, he was talking yeah. about how he felt today. What are you doing over there, Peak Brain? And similarly, you know, I have, I had a physical therapist call me up, uh, maybe in 2021, uh, we'd been working with an elder called me up. What are you doing? My client, what do you mean? She came in today without her cane. Okay. No, 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 no. What are you doing to her? I had no idea. And and when I met her, 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 um, she had a brain injury. She was in her seventies. And when you lose part of your motor cortex, you lose inhibition of the muscles. So the arm was up, you know, pretty tight and one on one side and her balance was off on that side. She has had to use a cane. And I guess she walked in to that uh, therapy session without a cane. And she came into our office a couple of days later with her arm relaxed. Wow. And, you know, it doesn't happen every time like this, but so many of the people that we work on who have more significant stuff are, are coming to us because these are things that don't usually change in conventional landscapes the allopathic medicine landscape. So when you take a personal training and a science and a fitness perspective on resources, not diagnoses, but the resource you want to work on and you iterate, it gives you agency. It gives you a hint of what's going on. It it, it breaks that mystery where somebody else is your expert and has the label and knows more about the thing than you do. And you become the person who gets to sort of validate your judgment of your own brain, try stuff, get it to change validated again in more data. I mean, you can try things that aren't neurofeedback. If you see your brain on a brain map, I had a a college student or a a prospective college student come in about four years ago. His dad's like, this guy is not going to thrive in college. He can't get out of his own way. He doesn't do his laundry. He's barely passing high school. And he got into college. I don't know how, but like, I'm really worried. And he's really worried. So we looked, took a look at his brain and his performance and I, you know, he had some stress and some fatigue, but he also had, as is classic, some pretty strong uh, resources for some aspects of executive function, not which wasn't well balanced, but I explained him how his essentially ADHD worked, you know, exceptional under high stimulus and drifty under low stimulus and some aspects of his sleep processing that might be impacted and pointed out the actual strengths that were there and what that might mean performance wise. And I thought I did a really good job of explaining why, you know, here's some resources, here's how you work and here's what you can do about it, including, you know, things like neurofeedback and other stuff. Didn't hear from him after that. I was surprised because, you know, it was a really clear, you know, reading of resources, some good benefit right there. Dad was excited. He was excited. Didn't hear from him. Until about two and a half years later, his dad called me and said, hey, uh, I just wanted to thank you. Uh, just that looking at his brain and talking to him about the fact this wasn't a disease process and here's the strength and here's a bottleneck and here's how you can lean in and here's what might work for you. Everything changed after that. He like decided to double down. He structured his time. He built some hacks. He, you know, he, he, he got through college in three years. He's finishing off right now. He's graduating next month. Wanted to thank you. Not because we did anything to his brain, but because we 
gave him agency to understand his brain so he could go, oh, okay, this lever, that machine, okay, okay, got it. And he learned how to drive and, and steer things in the direction sure. he wanted to.